So without further ado, Ishani, I'm handing over the virtual podium to you. Please, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Anusha. Thank you, Dr. Krishnamurti. Your um, session was really, really enlightening. enlightening and it's great because it's such an important topic you spoke about of EQ and IQ mixing together. And I will be touching a bit up on it, but not as much as Dr. Krishnamurti. Thank you for Ishan, having me. You here. will be great. You will be great. Go ahead. I'm waiting for your session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have taught university students for about two years, and I'm not traditional educator like all of you guys have um, joined over here. But I would still like to share my thoughts and you know get your thoughts back as well. So I'd like to start my session by just giving you a story Vinita, as to give a hot spot to this girl Arya Patra. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, apologies. Um, so I'd like to start this session just by you know just sharing a story with you guys that what inspired me to. Uh, take up this and uh, ambition or like have this ambition of um, turning complex scientific matter to make people understand better and why I'm just so passionate about science and why I think everyone should love science. It's very biased, but I feel everyone should love science. Um, so growing up, I suffered from a learning disability, but also what happened was we lived in a 30 story building and my mom has no formal training as an educator but one day one of our neighbors came neighbor's mom or my friend's mom she came home and she came to ours and she told my mom she asked my mom whether she would take tuition classes for her daughter as she's a working woman and my mom was a homemaker and was with me most of the time so my mom saying that, you know, she's not formally taught in, as an educator. She said that, I don't know if I would be able to do it. And then her, uh, my friend's mom was like, it's okay. I don't have the time. I'm a working woman. Can you please train my daughter? Now her daughter or my friend suffered with extreme learning disabilities. And she was going to a traditional Indian school, which teaches route learning and, um, all the se subjects are separate from each other. So math separate from English, history cannot mash, mesh with science, none of that. Um, and she didn't do well in terms of the traditional scoring system. So my friends started coming to my mom and uh, my mom never sat down with her or with me as well to teach something, memorize these sentences. All she used to tell was, go play or go for a walk in the park and stuff. And then me and my friend we used to get so curious about why are leaves this way? Why are leaves green? Why, is, why, are, why are flowers the way they are? And then we used to get things at home or like when we are playing, why does a ball hit another ball? And then that goes. So these introduced us to techniques of science and some principles of physics, biology, chemistry. We used to come home and then my mom used to sit down with us to teach us whatever was in our textbooks. And that made us understand science so much better because we observed and we explored it. And then we came and learned. So that's how I got introduced to science and my bias towards science as to why I love it so much. So having said that, I will start my session. Let me just share my screen. Sorry, I'm just having some permission problems. Okay. Right. I hope you can see my screen. Just a thumbs up if you can. Perfect. Okay. 
Right. So this is my topic for today. So how we can help uh, introduce complex scientific topics to students. I am choosing the topic biology. And then, you know, we'll just talk about how biology could be introduced to students. So in today's session, I'll cover something called the Montessori method. And I'm sure many of you have heard it or even practicing it. And I know that Gavin is a huge advocate of the Montessori method while teaching children. So I'll be introducing that method to you guys. What are some of the principles that Montessori method is based on? How can STEM, which is science, uh, technology, engineering, arts and math, how it can be, um, how can Montessori and STEM work together? Can science be taught online? Because now that we have the pandemic, we have either some, some schools are teaching completely online or there's a hybrid of, you know, some days in school, some days online. And then even to reach education, we have the strong platform of teaching online. So we can reach all this education material to children who are not as privileged to go to schools and learn. So how we can teach science online and if Montessori method can combine itself with science. And then we'll just go through a demo class, which is the biology part. And, you know, we can just go through how Montessori can be mixed with biology or with online teaching. So let's just introduce what Montessori method is. So Montessori method was developed by Dr. Maria Montessori in the early 1900s. Montessori is a scientifically based education approach that emphasizes independence, freedom within limits and respect for the child's natural, psychological, physical and social development. So it develops the child as a whole. Montessori education is based on the belief that all children are unique individuals. And they are not the traditional way of how Dr. Krishnamurti said that they are not lazy, they are not irresponsible. They are individuals who want to learn and they have so much potential to learn. And that's what Montessori method harnesses out of the children. And yeah, they just want to explore, they want to learn as much as we can. And that's what we teach. We want to enhance that and bring out that, those qualities from the children. So Dr. Montessori believed that children learn better when they are choosing what they want to learn, as opposed to you have to learn math, you have to learn history, you have to learn English. So Montessori classroom will look different than what a traditional classroom would look like. I, I was used to a classroom which had a whiteboard or even a chalkboard, a blackboard, and students just looking at that, sitting there for about six hours, just root learning the whole subject, which was sometimes pretty ineffective for students who didn't understand by root learning. So a Montessori classroom would have various activity stations for children to choose from. Teachers move from group to group instead of standing in front of the class, class a non-traditional grading system, a focus on the whole student. So the social, emotional, intellectual, and physical development are all considered while you're teaching the student any subject. So these are the eight principles of Montessori education. We'll just quickly go through it. So impact of movement and learning and coordination. So if there is no movement, Maria Montessori believes that if there is no movement, there is no cognition. So the key word to take away from this point is exploring. So the children have to explore. And it's not just children, even us. We need, when we are given our smartphone, I'm sure many of you don't know how it works just by reading instructions. And I'm sure it's like, it's a known fact that when you buy something, no one likes to read instructions. They like to explore. They like to fix things on their own. They want to see how it works themselves. So the key word here to take away is exploring. So we let the children explore, move. So maybe take a walk in the park or help your mom in the kitchen. So there are so many um, 
principles or there are so many skills that the children develop when they move and that's what enhances their cognition. Then there's choice and perceived control. So the children, they want a sense of control. And when they have the sense of control and they can choose what they want to learn or what they want to spend their time doing, they get that ownership that they want to finish this activity, they want to master this activity, or they want to finish this act. Uh, yeah, they want to finish it to the whole completion. And that instills confidence in the kids. Then interest in human learning, which is basically interest. You need interest to learn something. So either you develop that interest or, you know, let the child explore to develop the interest themselves. And then they will automatically learn. It's not that the children are lazy and they don't want to learn something. They just need to have interest in what they are learning. Then intrinsic reward, extrinsic reward and motivation. So extrinsic reward is something which shouldn't be given. For example, if you give a star to a student, that student is doing a certain activity for that star or for that chocolate. And the moment another teacher doesn't give that star or chocolate, so the motivation dies down. And that is not something that helps children develop self-motivation. And they need to develop the self-motivation to as which is an important life skill for them to harness to progress in life. So in order to develop self-motivation, the student must have interest, they must have choice on what they want to learn and just explore. So that helps them develop the self-motivation as opposed to some intrinsic reward of chocolate or stars or a sticker. Then peer interaction. It is very common for Montessori methods to have different age groups in a class. So about from grade four to grade six, the students could be in one class. And the younger students learn from the older students because they want to imitate and they look at the older student as a role model. And the older students teaching the younger students, they develop leadership skills and they develop how to be empathetic towards the younger students and they develop all these important life skills which would take them longer and turn them into a whole well-rounded human beings. Then contextual learning. How many times have we learned something that is completely out of context and we have no clue. We have learned a principle in physics or some formulas in physics without any context and not understood anything. So contextual learning is to put, to learn something in from context. So maybe the children have gone for a walk in the park and they see leaves and they see, not leaves, sorry, they see flowers and they see the different parts of the flowers. They see the stamen, the stigma, and all the reproductive parts, why are the uh, flowers so colorful? So they're colorful to attract bees for pollination. So it starts, it gives a context to learning. So it gives a context to children to learn and that's how they learn better. The second last principle is adult interaction. So children like to imitate adults and Adults are needed for Montessori education to give them guidance, to put a structure into their head and just to use positive language and display empathy towards them. Through these qualities, children learn important life skills, which again would turn them into a whole rounded human beings. Um, order in the environment. You know, if people have gone into a Montessori classroom, they will see that even though children are given choice, there is, there is an order in the environment. There are different places where there are activities, different stations where there are activities going on. And children are taught to keep their materials after use back into their place. So this teaches order in the environment, which also puts a structure or an order in their mind as to education or as to how to lead their lives. So you're teaching all these important life skills through these eight principles. So these are the eight principles of Montessori education and how, and now we look at how these principles can tie up with scientific teaching or introducing, introdu introducing complex scientific 
uh, topics to children. So how can STEM and Montessori education work together? So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. STEM related programs are more just than learning facts. They are philosophies that link various studies, various areas of studies and ensuring students are prepared to enter, enter society without technology, with where technology in, is increasing every day. Traditional education systems teach each subject separately through root learning, which we have seen is not very effective. And so you can teach all these philosophies together and with all the eight principles of Montessori education. So science in Montessori is known for introducing children to advanced topics in their early years. So preparing them for a lifelong of discovery, inquisitiveness, and exploring the world or even the universe. Topics range from how the world began to basic principles of astronomy, botany, chem botany chemistry, physics, and zoology. So Montessori lessons are meant to are meant to encourage a sense of wonder at the grandeur of the universe, the simple beauty of physical laws and the miracles of life. An essential part of introducing scientific topics are all these uh, curiosity, uh, you know, the sense of wonder. All of these are such important aspects to introduce scientific topics to ch children. Students learn to ask questions, follow a systematic process of observation, collect and analyze data, and conduct controlled experiments through which they can understand the universe, the world better. So STEM and Montessori are a perfect match. Why? Because there's a opportunity for hands-on discovery, learning through experimentation, learning through exploration, allowing for students to explore areas that draw their interest. So the students are enforced to learn something from the textbook that maybe doesn't make sense to them, bringing concepts together to create a more holistic academic experience, development of practical real world skills that move beyond root learning, adding the element of fun back into STEAM or STEM, sorry. Um, so the element of fun lacks when there is a traditional education system. So where there is the blackboard and the teacher in front, there's no fun. The students actually get bored. And that's why you see many students struggling with grades and just trying to learn. So there has to be an element of fun that students feel when they are learning or element of curiosity that, yeah, we are learning new things today. So now the question, can science be taught online through Montessori methods? So education should be flexible, number one. And now that we have the pandemic, it has made us realize why education should be flexible. And also the main motive of education influence is to spread uh, education as much as we can. So it can be adapted to meet the needs of the children and also the constraint of the environment as well and be accessible to students from all corners of the world, a philosophy that education influence is standing by. With the current public health crisis resulting in school closures, there's a question whether Montessori method could be taught online. And the short answer is yes, it can be. So yeah, even though the answer is yes, there are a couple of obstacles that needs to be overcome overcame. The first one is Montessori relies on hands-on uh, in instructions or hands-on exploration. So how do we do that when we are teaching a student online? So that is an obstacle we need to think about to try to overcome. And the second one is Montessori requires trained, trained educators or trained instructors who are trained in Montessori, which is true, but if we try to inculcate the eight principles, I'm sure even though we won't be able to turn it into a complete Montessori classroom, we can still help students 
develop the skills to learn and to study well. So yes, it needs trained um, educators, but we can also try to be those educators without the training. Maybe we can research more about how to incorporate Montessori in our classrooms, which helps the students. So these are the couple of obstacles that need to be overcome. But having said that, Montessori is a perfect way for online education because Montessori education is self-paced. So it doesn't have a syllabus that you have to finish chapter three in two days or you have to finish it before an exam. It is self-paced. It encourages independence and independent learning. And Montessori also requires a whole family approach. So in order for Montessori education to be successful, the whole family has to be incorporated or has to be involved in the child's education. And I'm sure researchers know how much, how important a family plays, uh, how important of a role a family plays when it comes to developing the skills that the child needs to lead their life in the real world. So Montessori is great for all those reasons. So let's just go through a demo class of, you know, introduction to biology and how, you know, we can try to incorporate Montessori into an online session. So introduction to biology, it will be more of a demo class where I'm also, you know, I'm all, almost treating you as children or as students, and we can go through this demo class together. So what is biology? 2000 years ago, ancient Greek and Roman scientists asked questions about the world around them because they were inquisitive, they were curious, why, is the, why does the world work the way it does? So their observations and conclusion form the basis of modern sciences that we all learn. So bios in Greek means life, logos in Greek means describing. So when you put these together, that is the definition of biology. Now let's put these words together, biology, which is the study of living things. Now, this is an activity that you can, an online activity that you can ask the children. So do you think this image is a living or a non-living thing? You can write your answers. I'm giving you 10 seconds to write your answers. So I'm sure 100% of you know that it is a living thing. Leaves and plants are living things. Now, again, is this a living thing? Again, I'm sure all of you know that a hummingbird is a living thing and that all living things are also known as organisms. Now, an offline activity that we can do before going into the lesson is ask the students to go on a walk with their parents. So maybe the parents can show the local flora and fauna that is growing in their country, in their wherever they live. And then, you know, it will be more relatable to them when we are teaching online. So that's how you can kind of try to incorporate Montessori with online education. So another activity. These are some of the images. I'm just, yeah. So from these, can the student pick out organisms from the non-living objects shown in the pictures? So let's just go into our activity. These are the organisms, which is the lion, the giraffe, a cactus plant, the frog, and a lotus. And these are the non-living things, chair, ball, and a PlayStation controller or an Xbox controller, to be exact. Right. So those were the online activities and then you can ask the students like i said to go out with their parents for a walk and then point out all the living and non-living things and maybe make a list of it and once the list is made the students can discuss on one of the online sessions what they saw or even take pictures of what they saw if they have access to mobiles or 
any sort of picture or they can draw it for you and then they can discuss it in an online session. So now let's talk about what makes something living. So living things are made out of cells. They use energy, so they have a met metabolism. They reproduce and they have inherited traits, which is called heredity. So all living things are made out of cells. If students have access to a microscope, maybe in the school, if it's a hybrid learning, you can always show the cells from an onion skin to make them understand that cells are the basic unit of life, that we are made out of billions of cells and that every organism you see is made out of these tiny structures called cell and that they are the basic unit of lives. So every living thing we see is made out of trillions and trillions of cells and that they are the basic unit of life. Now, the second point, living things use energy and move on their own. So why doesn't a chair move on its own? Whereas a child or, you know, you can tell them his friend or himself, they use, they can move on their own. They can sit, stand, run, play on their own. And why is that? That's because they are living and the chair or the ball is non-living non and it can't move and use energy on its own. So all living things use energy to survive. Now the third point is living, sorry. Yeah, these are just uh, some examples of animals moving. So, Living things use energy and they move on their own. So these are just some examples that the plant is growing on its own, um, children playing on their own, the, the bird flying, and even the dog running. So organisms use energy to perform various activities such as playing, running, fighting, and even growing. Now, the third point is all living things reproduce and make their own kind. So you can tell the children how their parents, you know, have the kids and how dogs have puppies and cats have kittens because they reproduce their own kind. So the duck has ducklings and how even a plant has its own, reproduces its own kind through seeds or through pollination. And then all living things have inherited traits. So why a puppy can't give birth to a kitten? Because it has inherited traits. So a dog will only give birth to a puppy. So living organisms produce offsprings that look like their parents because they pass something called a genetic material onto their babies. A dog could give birth, could never give birth to a baby giraffe. A dog will only give birth to puppies and those puppies will look very similar to their parents. So just a golden dog will give birth to a golden dog. It won't have traits of some other who is someone, some other dog who is not its parents. So that's how you can explain the kids about how living things are differentiated from non-living things. And then they could do some online activities. So examples of some, sorry, offline activities that can be displayed and discussed in an online class. So these activities promote the principles of Montessori education. So planting a seed and observing it grow. So observing it grow from seed to a sprout to a leaf or a plant and then flowers. So in this way, the children explore their environment. They know how it's working. Um, they can differentiate between what we just learned between living and non-living things because if you plant a ball, a ball won't reproduce on its own. It doesn't have all the principles that a living, um, a living organism has. So planting seeds can teach them about differentiation between living and non-living things. Then going into a walk going into nature for a walk and then categorizing, making a list, like I said, between living and non-living things. And then discussing all of these activities in an online session. 
then creating and observing rain gauges to learn more about natural processes such as evaporation. Again, students can make it and then display their creation, display that observation onto an online class. And that's how we can incorporate principles of Montessori into a hybrid type of learning. Now we'll go into another topic, which is the basic unit of life, that is the cell. So when you see a leaf under a microscope, you will see structures like this. Now this can be a little bit complex to students and maybe if the educators or you know a community can donate or contribute to that village or the area with the microscope, students can understand more as to what cells are. So they can, in a simple microscope doesn't have to be a very high powered microscope, but with that students can understand that a cell is a basic unit of life and many cells like this contribute to make a leaf like this. So just an image of a microscope. So how a microscope looks, how a basic microscope looks is just like this. Now, what are living organisms made of? So we can answer this question with the help of an instrument that is the microscope that we just saw. So the first microscope was invented in the 16th century, which was a very basic microscope, but scientists at that time could still see the onion cells and the cells in a cork wood. You could see all those cells, even with the basic microscope. Then we use this microscope to view things that are too small to be viewed by our naked eyes. So that's the cells under the leaf. To be exact, it's called the stomata, which allows oxygen in and out into the leaves or the carbon dioxide, the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen into the leaves. So what are living organisms made of? It's mean they are made out of the cell, which is the basic unit of life. It's found in all living things from the tiniest bacteria to a large blue whale. So the bacteria here and a large blue whale. So a large blue whale has trillions and trillions of cells, whereas a bacteria is made out of only one cell. So a single cell bacteria and a blue whale, which is made out of trillions of cells. So organisms can consist of one cell, which is the bacteria, or many cells, which is the blue whale. Now, all living things are made out of cells, and these cells come together to perform a particular job. So cells are the basic unit of life. Many cells make up a tissue. Many tissues come together to make up an organ. And a collection of organs make the organ system and a collection of organ system makes up the organism. So here is that example. So these are muscle cells, which turn into tissues, muscle tissues. And then these tissues turn into organs. So the stomach or the heart. And then collection of, you can say the stomach, the intestines, the large and the small intestine, the bile duct, all of these organs turn into a organ system and all these organ systems, which is the digestive system, circulatory system, reproductive system, it turns into a whole organism. So basically so cells have organizations that turn it, that have, they, they take up specific roles to turn into an organ, organ system and an organism. So similar to that, within a cell, they have a structure. So this is a cell. Every plant and animal cells has four structures, the nucleus, which could be um, thought of as the brain or as the government. I'm saying that because an activity follows after this. So a, nu a nucleus can be considered as the president's office. So it can be it can be called as the brain or the president's office because it gives important information 
throughout the cell as to what to do does it have time to is it time to reproduce is it time to ingest food is it time to go dormant and sleep it gives out all these important instructions and it's almost like the control center so how a city has a control center with the president's office or the brain has a control system for our body that's the role the nucleus plays then it has the cell mem membrane which is like our skin or like the city limits so the border of the city it can be called as the cell membrane so it is the outer protective layer just like our skin or the outer protective layer for a country or a border of a country now my mitochondria it's the powerhouse of the cell like a battery or the power plant in a in a city so it generates the power so it generates the electricity in the or it generates the energy in the cell so it's compared to the power plant and the cytoplasm you can compare it to our blood or you can compare it to air which is which allows all the transportation of different nutrients or in the air transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide within our bodies so you can compare that to air or the blood now why i'm comparing this is because we come to our so cell function just like a city or our body and yeah why i was comparing it because we can come to an offline activity which is the cell city project so here you can tell the students again most of these activities need collaborations of their parents which in which helps with again developing so many life skills which are so important so hands on um, you know collaboration with their parents so they can make a cell model which is like the city cell model which is fun a hands on way to help students remember the different parts of the cell the parts of the cells have similar function to the service of the city so extend this an analogy by having students make a model city with various buildings and cell parts so they can either make it into a diagram or they can you know something like this the city can be made on paper or a 3d model using clay or cardboard or any other creative ways so this activity is done offline and then you the students can talk about it online and what they learned and how they learned how to you know understand the different parts of the cell so this is one example where they have you know used the nucleus as the president's office uh, mitochondria as the nuclear generating the power plant nuclear power plant yeah so you can see the i think this is the nucleolus so this is the nucleus which is the president's office and then you know the site of um, the cell membrane which can be the city limits so this can be an offline activity that the students can display online and learn more about the cell and then you know while teaching this topic you can keep talking about what the careers and the hobbies could be related to whatever um subject you are taking or subject you are trying to make them understand here in the case of biology you can talk about what some of the careers are which we will talk about in a moment but through this you can instill a sense of wonder curiosity and imagination into the students which is so important then you can encourage students to explore more and ask more questions and the more questions they ask nothing is a stupid question the more questions they ask the more inquisitive they get and the more they learn and the more then and more they develop the life skills that they need to progress and become a well rounded human being then excite the students by sharing with them how they can use these skills to turn them into future careers or hobbies or how they can still use all of this to have that sense of wonder and imagination so let's end the session by showing some of the careers and hobbies so they can be a zoologist where they can study animals many students will want to play with animals so that is a career or a hobby they'll be interested in 
a microbiologist that studies cells and understands what cells do and you know why cells are so important or bacteria viruses why are they so important why did the covid uh, pandemic take place how did the vaccination work all of that so they can have they can understand they can turn into microbiologists and understand the workings of the cell they can turn bot they can talk talk about you can talk about career in botany and how they can use their interest in plants to study plants and uh, and the flowers and everything related to plants and why they are so important they can be forensic scientists to help solve to help solve crimes marine biologists to study aquatic lives and do research on that or they can just simply take it up as a hobby and turn into scuba divers to see and study more about the life under the oceans and astrobiologists to study alien life forms again something that will make students so curious about astrobiology are aliens real what you know make them under like make them more inquisitive about what astrobiology is and this in turn turns them so inquisitive about learning just what sciences are in general so there are so many more and remember keep exploring always be curious thank you thank you ishani thank you so much thank you thank so you. much Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight's session, and thank you, Dr. Nagmani, for your session, which helped us to um, to think that we need to stimulate our thinking skills to uh, enable the children to shift and sort information and use it appropriately for their own development, um, as well as the uh, as well as for the benefit of the society. And thank you, Ishani, for your interactive session. It made us realize that if topics are introduced rightly, uh, introduced rightly to the students, uh, they will develop an undying love and passion for the various branches of science, and it will instill uh, curiosity, wonder, and creativity into the students. And thank you so much. That was very, very, was very amazing. And I would like to request all participants, please pass your questions if you have any in the chat box. I have a question for Ashani. Hi, Ashani. How are you? That was really beautiful uh, presentation. I loved it. Hey, um, my question to you is, uh, Montessori, in the country that you're in, uh, what's the? how much Montessori are you seeing in the country where you are, and what's the level of training for teachers like? Uh, so my education system was from the Indian education system. Over here in Dubai, how it works is that there are different curriculums british american so i won't be aware of the british international and american curriculum but at least in indian there is not much about montessori and i don't think the teachers are trained in montessori what about your training i am just passionate about montessori i wasn't formally trained in montessori but in the future when i you know trying to teach even my own kids i will be taking the montessori method mm, okay cool i would like to add something for uh, that with ishani uh, i think in india they have a bias about montessori system because they think that too much freedom is given to the child and the child will not be able to fit into the rat race which is going to exist later on in life so yes. practically they don't have many preschool settings with montessori system i see very few montessori schools up to the uh, grade 10 um, and even then they are treated as uh, you know untouchables <laughs> if i can yes. say that mm -hmm. <laughs> even after they grow up graduate and get into the workforce uh, they are seen as uh, somebody who did not fit into the you know the formal system and they had to be forced into the montessori system that's how they view montessori here so i think they are they are totally biased about it uh, so if we have to make people understand the montessori system i think there needs to be a movement 
because whenever I came across some children with uh, uh, special needs, uh, they used to say, okay, if my child is not able to cope up with the curriculum in the formal system, can I put her in or him in the Montessori system? I, I was amazed at that question because how is your special needs child got to do something with Montessori? It's not, you know, only the children with special needs fit into Montessori system. It's everybody. Everybody yes. needs to be. <laughs> there is a big misconception of Montessori in the world. Um, just to give you some perspective on that misconception, Montessori is the widest, um, widest um, uh, denomination of education on earth. There's more Montessori schools than there are Catholic schools, Muslim schools, Christian schools in, on the planet. And that's simply because um, many schools in the USA, they've done something really remarkable where they've become a hybrid version of education. So they've got Montessori philosophy involved in their school, but they're not claiming that they are a Montessori school. They're saying we are based on the Montessori philosophy. However, we're not Montessori schools and therefore with 360 million people in, in America, you know, there's a, there's a lot of schools that you can have. But I think that the, the other concept, and this is what usually gets families that I meet um, over the line in terms of enrolling in Montessori is, I very simply explain to them that the gentleman who invented Google, Wikipedia, Amazon, Tesla, they are all Montessori children. And the one thing which is very important about these children is they think outside the box. They don't think exactly. like the normal children. And the reason why they don't think like normal children is they weren't educated like normal children. They were given freedom. They were given choice. They were given autonomy, agency, purpose, intent. And when you give children these six aspects in life, they take them and they run with them. And when you run with these things, you establish amazing creativity. Hence, this is what the world has become. We're moving to Mars. We're all driving electric cars. We can search anything on Google in a heartbeat. We've got an online dictionary for everyone called Wikipedia. Like These are all Montessori inventions because Montessori children are given freedom to choose. And when parents understand that, they suddenly uh, change their perspective of having schools. Montessori uh, pedagogy is places where children are fixed who don't fit into mainstream and they change their mindset into, ah, actually Montessori schools are places where children go to find themselves and become extremely creative. And then the revolution occurs. So yes. look, yeah. I just want to say, I've listened into both. I was trying not to do too much talking because this was a, Anusha it was her presentation. It was three amazing women. I thought I'm not saying anything, but Anusha said, Gavin, you have to say something. But I just want to say uh, three things. Anusha, thank you for organizing all of this. It's such a beautiful thing. Amazing for you to put all this work in and once again, upgrading the whole system of education influence. And number two, obviously, to Nagamani and Ashani, beautiful presentation, so insightful, so intelligent. We are very lucky to have you and we'll record these. We're going to cut them up and make them into beautiful little snippet videos and we're gonna send them out into the universe so that everybody can listen to your wisdom. Well, thank you for all of your time. And thank you, thank you all. And I would like to request any participants if they would like to speak or share their thoughts. And we do have Warda Iqbal would want to speak and I am trying to unmute. Um, Maybe they've accidentally put their hand up on the show. Okay. Is there anybody who'd like to speak or share some words? Please, please do come forward. Uh, yes, I want, would like to say something. My name is Wada Akbal. And uh, um, this is such a really an amazing session I have seen uh, because I have no idea about the Montessori. And I'm basically a senior Cambridge teacher and I have just joined people. And I really appreciate all of, especially Ishani for presenting such a beautiful presentation here. And uh, I think in the schools right now, we all are practicing, I think in India and Pakistan, there are same cultures and same traditions. So we are actually practicing the same things like we are making PowerPoint presentations, slide presentations. And also I'm going to add here something here, Ishani, Gavin sir and Ms. Anusha, that uh, we are also uh, means making video lectures as well for the children and for the development of their mind. And even I think, um, 
uh, it is a I think a good addition right now the technology because it helps us as well to learn more things and uh, I just want to add one more thing here that uh, regarding Montessori and uh, obviously this is uh, one of the first uh, uh, this means the first step of a child you can say so a child uh, first learning step. So I think uh, this is such a good session that right now, uh, currently in which era we are entering, obviously we are after the COVID, uh, there is so much psychological impact on children mind, even us as well. And uh, this is the way how we are actually means uh, also learning with others and sharing with others and uh, actually approaching others. And I'm really thankful all of you, especially Anusha Shrista. Um, I'm sorry, no, I'm not pronouncing your name well. <laughs> and all the presentation and especially given sir, because I'm mostly connected with you on LinkedIn and uh, I'm really happy to see and congratulations Ishani for such a nice presentation. Thank you, Thank you sir.